guys. Good morning, most of you. So I'm going to uh, give uh, a presentation. The title is Pride Cluster Spectrum Clustering of Pride MSMS Data. So first of all, I just really wanted to acknowledge the people who did uh, most of the work. So especially Johannes Gris and more on the scientific part and we want on the technical infrastructure part. And then also uh, Jasset and Steve, also Henning with his supervision as well, and the rest of the Pride team, especially uh, Noemi and Jose. So I just wanted to, to make it clear that, yeah, I've been also supervising the, the work, but I wanted to highlight really the people who did the work, most of the work. Okay, so the overview of the talk, so I'm going to go through four points. The first one is what is Pride Cluster and the concept. The second is the new algorithm that we have, that we are running the uh, algorithm in Hadoop. The third part will be devoted to the new uh, web interface. And I will show you how you can access the data right now, today. And then I will show you some examples about how we uh, are uh, performing uh, quality control of uh, data in Pride using, using this, this approach. Okay, so just go for the, for the first point of the talk. And just an introductory slide to uh, the people there who don't know what PRIDE is. PRIDE stands from the, for the proteomics identification database. PRIDE stores mass spectrometry uh, based proteomics data, including peptide and protein expression data, mostly identification, also quantification, post-translational modifications, mass spectra, both as raw data and big list files. Uh, as much technical and biological metadata as possible and any other related information. So we focus on tandem MS approaches. I mean, this, this, is, this is the, the URL for uh, those of you who, uh, who uh, don't know about the resource. So the motivation of this project, the Pride Cluster project, was the fact that uh, data is stored in Pride as originally analyzed by the submitters. So really no data reprocessing is done our, at our site at least so far. Uh, the data uh, has then heterogeneous quality. So there are experiments that are really very good, some others that are not that good. So it's difficult to make the data directly comparable. We also, when we started the project like four years ago, we wanted to enable assessment of published proteomics data. And also we wanted to facilitate uh, data reuse, for instance, in other bioinformatics resources like, like uh, Uniprot here at the ABI as well. So uh, the main concept of the project is to use a spectral clustering to reliably group a spectra coming from the same peptide. So we want to group together peptides coming from different experiments that are identifying the same peptides, infer reliable identifications by comparing submitted identifications for spectra within a cluster. Uh, the idea was of course, was of course to increase quality uh, through data increase, so taking advantage of the wealth of data in Pride, and the algorithm uh, should be able to adapt to new techniques or new uh, type of uh, labeling, uh, chemical labeling uh, compounds that would generate new spectra. So for those of you who really want to know more about the whole project, like we, we published this paper in Letter Methods a couple of years ago, summarizing the results of the first phase of the project. So basically this is the, the concept that I want to explain. Imagine, of course, the numbers need to be higher, but imagine that we have these uh, five spectra submitted to Pride. Four of them uh, were uh, originally identified this same peptide, other one, the other one didn't. So at the end, we basically will say that this identification has, uh, or is more reliable than this one. Of course, it's not just five. The initial threshold that we use is uh, at least uh, 10 spectra in uh, a cluster and the ratio uh, higher than 70%. Ratio means basically the, the percentage of the identifications that have a, a majoritary sequence. So in this case, the ratio would be 80% uh, because there would be uh, five uh, five spectra, four of each, uh, four, of, uh, four of them would identify the same peptide. But of course, in this case, we wouldn't really fulfill the criteria because at least we need 10 spectra. I will explain this again during the talk so we, you will get uh, you will be used to the concept. So uh, at the time, we didn't perform any pre-filtering of the data. We took all the identified spectra for all instruments and species process, were processed together. Uh, 
This analysis was performed in June 2012, so now three years ago, a bit more. And at the time, we clustered or identified spectra that were public, because uh, they need to be public, of course. At the time, there were almost 21 million in Pride, using a modified version of the MS cluster algorithm, published by Paul Pesna's group. And we also did uh, uh, made all the Java code available in in this uh, in this uh, Google SVM repository. We are going to change the location of this now, of course, because it's no longer it's not going to be uh, it's, it's going to be discontinued. Those clusters which contain only mainly one peptide are considered to be reliable, as I explained before. And the idea also, as I wanted to highlight before, is that the more data, the more stable the consensus spectrum uh, would become. At the time, this original analysis took more than two weeks in the EBI internal farm, so more than 600 CPU days. And I just wanted to uh, to show you one of the examples coming from that analysis. We have this uh, cluster that contains 521 uh, PSMs, more than or about 97.5% of it uh, were identified in the same sequence. So all and the rest were just identifying an heterogeneous strange of sequences. So in this case, we consider that this peptide identification is, is reliable. Okay, so, but the problem that we have is that we did this analysis in June 2012, but since then, and thanks to the involvement of Pride in the Protein Exchange Consortium, we really had increased a lot uh, the, the data contents in Pride in these last few years. At the moment, we are receiving between 150 and 200 data sets per month. So last month, I think, I think it was a record, 201 data sets. So really, we are experiencing a, a, a exponential growth in the, in the results. So due to the increase of uh, data in Pride, especially in the most popular MC value, uh, value windows, the original algorithm did, did not work anymore because it uses the precursor N of a seed as, uh, as the input for the analysis. So it was not possible to cluster all the spectra that uh, were available in this, at least the highly popular MC, uh, MC windows. It was also impossible, uh, due to the, the current size, to extend the algorithm to unidentified spectra. That is also something that we wanted to do at some point. And also the, the problem is that the farm uh, here at ABI uses the load sharing facility, LSF, and really, it caused a lot of problems because uh, all the errors need to be uh, administered manually, and then it was very, very troublesome to to, to run the algorithm for, for the whole of Pride at the time. So that's why we decided to to move into the Hadoop uh, Hadoop platform, and this is the, basically the, the the second point that I will be mentioning in the talk. So uh, Hadoop, for those of you who uh, who don't know about it. Is a uh, open source project that is uh, sponsored by Apache, and the idea is to parallelize uh, using the MapReduce algorithm that was uh, developed by Google. It optimizes the work distribution among different computer machines, and it solves really many general issues of large parallel jobs: scheduling, inter-job communication, and failure. These three things really are not managed very well using uh, the standard farm LSF. So really, it's a big advantage, apart from the uh, increase in parallelization and speed, it's really a big advantage to use Hadoop due to, uh, because it's much easier to, to run the whole thing. So I'm not going to explain in detail uh, how the algorithm works, because we have tried also different similarity measures between the spectra and different scores. But at least I wanted to explain the concept of uh, a sliding window. So this is basically a bunch of spectra before um, uh, that, uh, or, or clusters containing different spectra. Then uh, using the initial uh, MC uh, precursor value, uh, we are going to move uh, to uh, the window slightly and a new spectrum is going to incorporate and it's going to be compared to the, to the rest that are included in that MC, uh, MC value window, okay? So a new one will be incorporated, and then uh, one, the, when you move the window, 
no, one of them in the lower end will be uh, will be removed, and then the spectrum will be compared to the rest of the components in that window, and then it will be added as a different spectrum or cluster, or it will be merged to uh, one of the existing clusters before. Of course, this process is uh, iterative, and it is uh, parallelized using the Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop infrastructure. Also, we make sure at the beginning that at least the spectra set uh, one of the six uh, highest peaks in the spectrum. This as a way because otherwise you need to make too many comparisons at the beginning when you have millions of spectra to compare. So to assess the algorithm, we initially used three, uh, what we, we call uh, three uh, test data sets, what we call the UPO, the COPD, and the CPTAC. They have a slightly different uh, characteristics that I think they make, they make, they are good for this kind of testing purposes and uh, they contain a maximum about 1.2 million spectra. So all of them are searched with extending and OMSA, then we cluster all the identified spectra, and then the resulting consensus spectra are again searched using different search engines as well. And then we uh, measure the cluster accuracy and, uh, and also uh, measure those ratios as I told you. We move later to use a representative subset of human data in pride, about 10 million spectra. And again, in the last few months, we have really been improving the algorithm iteratively. So uh, the latest run, the one that I will show you, that is publicly available, is from May, so about two months ago. We have another one that is not yet publicly available because we haven't had time to load the data in the database that is, uh, is a bit bigger, but anyway, the one that I will show you it has almost 51 million PSMs, it represents a 2.5-fold increase. But at the same time, you will see the big difference, <laughs> about one day on the EBI Hadoop cluster, and again, without any problems of uh, management, and uh, no manual intervention is necessary. As you can see, two, uh, three years ago, it took uh, about two weeks to run. The results are available through the new web interface that I will show next. The results are uh, summarizing more than 7 million clusters, including data from 25, sorry, 26,000 essays, more than uh, almost 800 data sets, and uh, involving uh, almost 300 different tax IDs. Tax IDs are basically different species. Okay, I forgot to mention, sorry, that we have now, uh, again, internally data from a new run that contains almost 70 million spectra. It's just because uh, we have been, again, doing things iteratively, and uh, when the next run is available, it would contain 70 million, 70 million uh, spectra. So uh, all the results can be accessed through the Pride cluster, new web interface. This is the URL. And as you can see, there is a big sign of beta, <laughs> so of course, it's not a definitive uh, website. Uh, I think that the functionality there is already quite good, but we are still refining things. And basically, this is the, the home page. And if you click here on search, you will, uh, I mean, you can search by peptide sequence or uh, basically any time of uh, annotation, human, species, or modification. If you click just in search, you will get a list of the peptide sequences and the, and the clusters, and here you can filter based on the species or modifications. And basically, uh, you will get here all, uh, I mean, you can select the number of, of, of items that you want to see. And you can see here there are more than uh, almost 500,000 results. And the reason is that in the, in the website, we only uh, load at the moment the classes that we are that we consider to be high quality based on the criteria that I told you before. So I want to show a couple of examples just for you to understand the concept. The first one is of course uh, a one perfect cluster. <laughs> so in this case, uh, I'm talking about this uh, peptide sequence, uh, and basically uh, there are uh, this peptide sequence. You can see here that uh, the, the spectra in the, in that cluster come from. Uh, for uh, uh, different species, human, drosophila, uh, mouse, and rat. They don't have modifications. And here, as you can see, all the PSNs identify the same peptide sequence. There are 880 coming from four species, coming from 28 different projects. 
and all of them are, you can see them here listed from um, more, more or less they they uh, use the same the same uh, instrument LTQ arbitrary. So in this case is that is the perfect example. 880 PSNs give uh, the same vector identification. Data is comes from four different species and 28 different data sets that have been uh, again submitted by different people. And in this case, it seems that most of them come from the same instrument. In the website, you also can see the spectrum, the spectrum using the LORIKIT uh, spectrum viewer uh, done by uh, uh, the colleagues at Seattle. And uh, in this case, you can see that the uh, coverage of the different from ions is very good. And at the bottom of the website, you can also see two charts, one describing the distribution of the precursor uh, of a seed on the consensus spectra and the cluster. And then also you can see a measurement of the spectrum similarity. So in this case, what does what does that beta signal respond to? So in this case, corresponds to one serine hydroxyl hydroxy methyl transferase. So all of the, well, the different isoforms. I just to tell you that uh, where that peptide sequence comes uh, comes from. I also wanted to show uh, uh, also a good cluster, uh, a good example, but it's not as perfect as the previous one. So in this case, as you can see, the the sequence is really really very long. Again, data comes from, uh, in this case, three different species. All of them are plants. And in, the, in this case, there's also some uh, uh, examples of um, carbamino methylation in, in the case of the annotated uh, modifications. So in this case, as you can see, there is one uh, sequence that is extremely majority, covering almost 90 Eight percent of the cases, 2,872 PSMs, and then there are a lot of uh, PSMs that uh, uh, originally identify a different sequence. So in this case, we would give reliability to this sequence, and we wouldn't give reliability to these ones. Again, here you can see the the different projects that the, the PSMs come from. So again, uh, here we can see the annotated spectrum. Again, here the sequence is very long, of course, and the coverage of the of the, the flaming ions is not uh, as good. Uh, so what, what does that beta sequence correspond to? So that really uh, corresponds to the uh, Rubisco enzyme that, as you know, is the key enzyme in the photosynthesis. So it's really, uh, you can really explain why you can only uh, find that uh, sequence in, in plants. So again, I have shown you, uh, you two examples. One that is actually perfect, there are a few of those, and one that is almost is also very good, with almost 98% of the of the of the PSNs identifying the same the same peptide sequence. Of course, using the the, the high quality C, uh, clusters, we uh, PREP now provides a spectral libraries from different species. Here's the URL. We provide for uh, uh, human, bacillus, rat, uh, Arabidopsis, uh, Sinecococcus, that, that bacterium, uh, mouse, uh, other bacterium. Yeah, it basically the the species that contain the the highest amount of PSNs in type. Also, very importantly, we have generated a, a library of of contaminants based on the results that we we have uh, observed. So um, the last point of the of the talk that I wanted to explain is how we are now using uh, the results from Pi cluster to perform uh, quality control of data of data uh, submitted to Pride. So I wanted to show uh, two examples of this. We are doing other things, but, I, uh, but uh, just to, to give you uh, an idea about what we are doing at the moment. So again, this is the initial uh, uh, result of the search in the Pride cluster web, and now we are going to select. The, the the biggest cluster. So you can see this one cluster containing almost 22,000 spectra with a ratio that is uh, originally a bit higher than 70%. So it will be more or less in the limit. So you will uh, you will be asking your, uh, wondering yourself what what this sequence corresponds to. So uh, just to uh, give you some idea first, this is the the peptide sequence. Again, more uh, slightly higher than 70%. 66, sorry, 65 species represented, and with containing 90, 29 different modifications. And when you see, when you go uh, a bit uh, lower in the page, you can see 
that there are three sequences that are really very close. So they have uh, they have a, a slight changes from uh, aspartic acid to asparagine and a small change like that. But actually, the three sequences, so in total, they correspond to about 80% of the data. All of them, all of them, uh, actually come from the same protein, and uh, the the protein they are coming from is actually trypsin. So it's just uh, basically that uh, it, they are. Uh, uh, sequences that uh, have identified uh, uh, trypsin in the, in the original experiment, uh, basically because the original authors look for a contaminants, uh, a contaminants database together with the with the target database that they wanted to use. So this is, of course, what what should be done. But then you will be wondering what is uh, what is the rest. So you can only see here a small number. I mean, this is a very long tail of results, starting by this one that comes only from one project. But this one comes from four different projects. So in our opinion, we have been checking this for a few ones, not all of them manually, but we have uh, checked some of them manually, is that they come from data sets where search with a contaminants database, for example, CRAP, was not performed. So that's a way, so these identifications should have been initially identified as trypsin, but as the authors didn't, didn't do this, then they were identified uh, as something else. So uh, this is a way to identify for us which spectra, did, uh, sorry, in which projects or which data sets did uh, uh, this, kind, uh, this kind of um, uh, search using a contaminants database was not done. So, uh, so this is basically what I have explained so far is a QC at the data set level, but of course we can also do QC at the peptide sequence level. And for that, uh, we have uh, one resource, is also still in beta, it's called Plite Proteomes. The idea is to provide a condensed and across data set view of Plite archive for identification data. The idea is that different PSNs are grouped at peptide sequence, and the peptide sequence are remapped to a recent, recent version of Uniprot KB. So at present we are using uh, the complete proteomes version, and uh, Pride cluster is used as an extra evidence for the for the different PSMs. So we, you will understand this better now. So this is uh, this is basically the same perfect cluster that I showed you before. So that this beta sequence with uh, with 880 PSMs. Uh, providing the same peptide identification. So uh, in this resource, um, in, in Pride Proteins, what we did is we grouped together all the evidences coming from uh, the different uh, peptide identifications across Pride, and we grouped them at the, at the protein level. So in this case, again, is the protein that I mentioned before, serine hydroxymethyl transferase. And uh, this particular peptide sequence, that is this one, the one that I saw before for the cluster, is this one in the sequence here, and is this one here. Basically, we will uh, we will say that it has been uh, reliably identified, and as the evidence, we will provide a link to the uh, to the Pride cluster web, as I saw you before. So we are doing, of course, this for uh, for the, the proteins in different species. At the moment, we are doing it for human. We are doing it for a mouse, rat. And Arabidopsis. Again, this is not uh, finished work yet, but uh, but we are getting there. So um, yes, you you uh, have shown you how we can do uh, quality control at data set level, but also at the individual peptide sequence level. So I just wanted to finish the talk with uh, uh, explaining the ongoing and future work. So we have uh, we uh, we have managed to uh, cluster recently all public spectra again. Uh, public, identify and identify in Pride uh, about 250 million that were clustered in about eight, nine days. And uh, we are now have started to, to, to use to analyze the information. Mixing together, identify and identify a spectra we expect to, uh, to uh, rescue identifications that were not originally provided by in the submissions. So, and plan press for the future, provide uh, feedback based on classing results at the time of submission. This uh, would be a nice project, and we have been thinking about this for a long time, but it requires quite some infrastructure. And also a correct and reliable cluster based on validating on the, on the results of the, of the validation pipeline uh, when submitted data to Pride. 
So, uh, conclusions, just to finish the presentation, uh, spectrum clustering is used in Pride as a way to access the quality of the PSNs and the datasets. Uh, we uh, are now using a new algorithm that we call Pride H because it's run in Hadoop. It's perfectly scalable and suited for the exponential data growth experience in Pride. Pride cluster can identify reliable identifications in Pride, uh, as I uh, uh, as I showed you before, and also we can detect very importantly systematic errors in proteomics experiments, like for instance the fact that, that people didn't run uh, a search with uh, a contaminants database. So we think that novel knowledge can be can be derived. And that's basically it. Since I included the acknowledgments at the beginning, I just want to uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh Thanks. Well, that was a that was a really really impressive uh, project. Um, yeah, I, I just have a question about the the libraries you guys released for the FTP download. Um, yeah. Are they segregated by tissue at all? No, they are segregated by a species, not by tissue. It's something that we could do. Yes, it's an idea we could do. At the moment, we segregate them by by a species. Uh, okay, and and also, uh, like, what's the release schedule for those those libraries? Are they continuously updated? So as you as you can see at the moment we are in beta status. So we we have to first uh, stabilize all the pipeline, all the production system, and at that point we will be able to uh, really decide how often we want to do this. Our idea, our initial idea, is to do it either every three months or either, uh, every six months. That would be uh, our <coughs> idea. But we need to uh, we need to take a final decision based on the on the work. That is required to to do it. Um, um, we haven't uh, we haven't taken a final decision about this. But again, our initial idea is to release every three or six months. Okay. Uh, thanks. Great. Yeah. Are there any quest other questions for Juana? Thank you, Juan. Thank you. A great presentation. Thank you. Okay, so our second presentation will be presented by Jessica Wang. Uh, Jessica is one of the VTK physician fellows and a clinical cardiologist at UCLA. Um, and today she will be presenting about using a mouse genetics resource called the Hybrid Mouse Diversity Panel to identify common genetic variation in heart failure susceptibility using a genome-wide association approach. Uh, without further ado, allow me to introduce Jessica. Hi, everyone. So, so my talk today is a little bit different, different from the usual talks where you hear at this conference. And so um, I hope that um, everything can be um, understandable. And also, I think I put this talk sort of in the context of what could be done on patient data as well. Um, so, so far, um, I did this work um, as a graduate student in the STAR program at UCLA um, in human genetics. And this is under, this work was un done under the guidance of Dr. Jake Lucas um, um, on, um, and in collaboration with Dr. Even Wang and um, uh, and my partner in crime, Christoph Rao, who is now a postdoc at Yiving Wang's lab. Um, so, okay, this okay. okay, so um, heart failure is a common disease and it's the leading cause of hospitalization for people over the age of 65. And it's estimated that one in five people will develop heart failure in a lifetime, and so some of you may already know that. And once hospitalized for heart failure, the chance of dying is 50% in five years. Um, and about half of the cases, heart failure is due to systolic dysfunction, um, which means cons the contractile function is impaired. About half of the other cases are due to diastolic dysfunction, which means that um, the contractile function is relatively preserved, but the heart is unable to relax properly. And given how common heart failure is, um, I'm motivated to understand how genetic variation, whether acting alone in combination or together with extrinsic lifestyle factors such as diet and exercise, can contribute to heart failure susceptibility in the general population. 
and understanding how uh, these genetic variation affect disease can provide insights into promoting health. So, um, so there are many ca causes for heart failure, and they're listed on the screen. And um, regardless, regardless of what the primary causes are, um, there's um, now there's a belief that genetics can play a part in them. We know that genetics control certain types of heart failure, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or familial dilated cardiomyopathy, which uh, in which cases a lot of the times there are single mutations that are found in these patients that can cause heart failure. But there's still within the same family that share the same exact mutation, there's a lot of variation in terms of how the, man the disease is manifested. I have a um, um, that, that her son presented at the age of six and then a grandson presented at the age of six months. And so there's definitely a lot of variation, in, uh, whether it's lifestyle, whether it's the environmental toxin, or whether it's common genetic variations uh, that contribute to these changes. It's an uh, important question because uh, the medications that we give to the patients can be affected by what is causing the disease. Um, so... So I'm gonna. So here is just a slide demonstrating how genetic variation or mutation can change amino acid sequence, therefore causing changes in structural proteins, therefore uh, causing disease ultimately in a person. Um, so there's. We talked about earlier that there's simple sort of large effect mutation, and there are these common mutations of small effect sizes, uh, that can affect um, in different genes, but in combination, even though by by itself, um, it may not have very large effect, but in combination, it can cause very large effects. And these changes often are not protein coding, they're in the regulatory regions. Um, and so there's a thought that simple Mendelian diseases are, are uh, about 85% of the cases are caused by large mutations that are actually affecting protein sequences. But then there are these uh, common, but the rest of them may be, uh, affect, uh, may be caused by regulatory mutations. Um, so genome-wide association study um, is an approach where you basically take the genetic, uh, the genome of a person, oh, sorry, of a population, and you test one single nucleotide polymorphism at a time to see if the the, the phenotypic trait of interest is associated with certain genotype. And so you do that genome-wide, and and what you get at the end is something called Manhattan plot, which is plotted on the right-hand side. It gives you um, the, the association signal by the position on the genome. So in this case, um, in this summary example, the, uh, the green dots that are very, very high um, or very, very low, I guess depending on whether we're talking about the p-value or the negative log base 10 of the p-value, um, that the association signal is very significant for chromosome 10 at the very end of chromosome 10. So there have been uh, very successful heart failure, uh, sorry, very successful genome-wide association studies done in human. They include coronary artery disease, lipid disorder, and a bunch of different like, diabetes, um, height. Uh, these are very classic examples. Um, in terms of genome-wide association for heart failure, though, um, the success has been quite somewhat limited. Um, that is because um, what I believe, or we generally believe that is because there's a lot of heterogeneity in heart failure, and we just saw how uh, the, there are so many different causes of heart failure and also different classifications of heart failure, whether it's systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction. And so there's been a quite a tremendous difficulty in finding out what are the common genetic variation affecting heart failure. So in one um, consortium study called the CHARGE Consortium, there has, in this cohort that involved 20,000 people, um, it, they found um, basically three SNPs three genome location that's been associated with heart failure, two in Europeans and one in African Americans. Um, and then in terms of what's underlying these signals uh, until today, uh, it's been a few years since this study was published, until today uh, we still don't have any sense of what, what is going on under, under that. Um, and so subsequent to those studies, uh, people did dilated cardiomyopathy a specific study. So that it's more of a um, select patient population, and they were able to identify two SNPs, and they were able to validate one of the genome location, uh, the gene called BAC3. Um, and, then, and then a little bit 
a few years after that, um, someone did an association study on African Americans um, using uh, echo uh, parameters and found several loci, but I don't think those have been validated yet. Um, so in any case, in the human population, due to the environmental and genetic, uh, environmental, um, basically the heter ideological heterogeneity, it's been very, very difficult to identify common genetic variations in the in the human population. So uh, the project started as, as a hope to make that bridge to um, start making headways into identifying these, um, what could be affecting um, the variation and heart failure manifestation. Um, for me, very, a very immediate example is that two people at the same age comes in with the same risk factors. Um, they've both suffer a myocardial infarction, but one goes on to have heart failure, the other one goes back to play basketball in a few weeks. Uh, so what is the difference underlying this? So the so we have this uh, mouse panel called the hybrid mouse diversity panel. It's made up of uh, more than 100 in, inbred strains of mice. Um, and uh, um, and then uh, in, in among these populations of mice, some are called classical inbreds. These are the ones that were initially bred by the fancy mouse trade um, in the, I guess the late 1800s. Um, and uh, they've been, basically these are the black sticks, the, the bulb C mice that we routinely use in the lab for specific purposes. And from their use, uh, people have discovered that these mice have very different characteristics. Some are good for studying um, autoimmune disease, some are good for studying atherosclerosis. And so people have crossed these mice to each other um, and then brother and sister pair mating them for many generations so that they create a new, uh, they create new strains of mice based on these classical inbred strains um, that are also inbred um, and their genomic material is fixed to either of the parental strains after series of breeding. And we um, included about 80 of these recombinant inverse strains in our panel to increase the power of association. Um, and so, and this mouse resource is unique in that um, all these mice have been sequenced, so there's no cause that goes into sequencing, uh, sorry, they've been genotyped, um, but in a few of them, uh, about 15 of them have been se completely sequenced. And so we're able to um, get basically based on the genotype and the sequencing information, essentially have sequencing data for almost all of these mice without extensive genotyping every time we use them. Um, so th that has uh, many advantages. Uh, one is cost, and the other is that we're able to accumulate data um, from time from this experiment to the next experiment. So we can directly compare um, the results uh, from a bone study or an obesity study or a heart failure study and be able to use the information across platforms. And um, then also because they're genetically, um, they're in the bred in a control environment in the vivarium, so we're able to control the environment much better than um, uh, in, in human study, for example. So um, uh, fundamentally, the hybrid mouse diversity panel harbors a wealth of um, natural common genetic variations in the mouse population. And because of this variation, it allows us to have basically a population of small people or, or mice to work with. And we can think of these mice as a population that we might work with in the human world. So, um, so what we did is that we treated these mice with a medication called isopaternal. And it's a medication that causes the heart to um, work harder and be stronger. Um, it is good for the heart, good for heart function, but over time, uh, because of the, um, the adrenergic overdrive, the hearts in general uh, go on to develop um, hypertrophy and or dilation. And so we use hydrosopaternal as a way to um, stimulate heart failure in a uniform way. And the mice were treated with the same dose of um, isopaternal uh, by body weight um, to, to uniformly um, um, have this cardiac injury. Um, and so we collected a number of phenotypes relative uh, relevant to human heart failure um, that include bod total body weight for fluid retention, um, liver and lung weight for fluid retention, also total heart weight, um, and also individual chamber size weight um, for cardiac hypertrophy. We also have data on fibrosis and also collected uh, frozen tissue and um, obtained um, RNA 
uh, extracted RNA and ran them on gene expression array. Uh, we also uh, did, so I, I, my main part of this project is to do all the echoes for the mice. Um, um, so we had um, on the neck, basically the echo, the echocardiogram, I guess a lot of them, a lot of you are not familiar with this. Uh, echocardiogram is basically using ultrasound to examine the heart um, in, in live people or mice. Um, and uh, this, here's a picture of how you might um, use an echo beam and you can um, look at the heart in its short axis. So on the left is the right ventricle and then on the left, uh, on the, on the left is the right ventricle, on the right is the left ventricle. And you can put something called uh, uh, an M mode, which is to measure the wall thickness through the straight blue line uh, across time. So you can see that there on the left side of the screen, the green represents the EKG signal. And then you can see the heart contracting, uh, the left ventricle contracting and relaxing with each uh, cardiac cycle. And so with that, we can measure the wall thickness um, and the internal chamber dimension, as well as uh, uh, calculate things like uh, left ventricular mass based on the two uh, values above, as well as fractional mass shortening, which is how much the internal dimensions shorten during systole. Um, and so we have data um, for the isopaternal treated mice uh, in four time points, a baseline week one, two, and three. And for the control, we had a baseline data as well as week three, uh, just as an internal control. And so the um, some some results from the study. Um, so it showed that isopaternal in exhibit uh, basically induced um, a variation in terms of how much the heart hypertrophy. Um, so for example, the black six mouse that we use commonly in the lab doesn't really hypertrophy that much versus um, valve C on the left. And also there are these recombinant inverse strains on the very left that increase their heart weight um, by twofold. And then in terms of fibrosis, um, if you look at different strains and also control versus isopaternal, um, there are some strains that have more fibrosis at baseline, for example, KK. But when you treat with isopaternal, the, the fibrosis, the white part versus the pink part, pink is muscle and white is fibrosis, the fibrosis increased very, very dramatically in certain strains. And um, this is um, called circles plot um, that plots the um, left internal uh, the ventricular internal dimension before isopaternal treatment and after isopaternal treatment. And there's uh, variation at baseline, but with treatment, there is additional variation. And those variations do not correspond necessarily to the baseline variation. Um, and then so it shows that there is something that's controlling the, the amount of hypertrophy that may not be at work at baseline. So, um, so this is just another picture showing the variation on sort of a scale that you can compare with um, from the left to the right. So there's a basically tremendous variation in terms of the, uh, the absolute magnitude and also the, dif the difference in the next page. Okay. So, um, so in terms of the distribution of the trace in the population, um, and then the overall um, trend of the data is that um, upon isopaternal treatment, we uh, observed that um, overall the, um, the wall thickness increased at week one, and um, it kind of is not as increased at a later time point. And the same is fractional shortening. So fractional shortening and internal uh, uh, and the IVSD, which is the, the, the wall thickness, increased at week one. Um, and somehow it's not as increased later on. Uh, but in terms of the left ventricular mass, um, as estimated by echo and also left internal dimension, there's sort of a progressive increase and kind of plateaus towards week two, weeks two and three. Um, and the bottom panel just shows the difference between baseline and the corresponding time points. And so you can see the difference there as well. Um, <coughs> Um, and so even though the average trend is such, um, but within um, the panel, if you look at individual mice, the trend may be different. And this is, uh, it is this variation that allows us to do the mapping study. So for example, the fractional shortening in blue 
Um, that mouse is called KKHIJ. It's also the same mouse that had a lot of fibrosis after isopaternal treatment and more fibrosis than other strains at baseline. That mouse really, I was not happy with isopaternal challenge. Uh, but even by week one, uh, the fragnal shortening in terms of how well the heart contracts goes way down. Um, it's probably showing that the isopaternal is too much for the mouse instead of making the um, the, fresh, uh, the heart contract better at week one, it makes it contract worse. Um, and then the heart continues to get, uh, to be sick or just stay sick uh, versus the other mice, they, they, had, they have different uh, response size paternal. And then we also looked at the relationship between the traits. Um, this is a, obviously a very simple analysis, uh, just correlations across different traits. But it tells us certain things that um, such as that um, uh, the fractional shortening was negatively correlated with left ventricular internal damage. I, I forgot to mention earlier um, uh, something about echocardiogram. So the echocardiogram can measure things like um, contraction, which is a prognostic indicator of how someone will do. And also internal dimension is a very important uh, prognostic indicator as well as left ventricular mass. And that's the reason why we um, ch uh, chose to do echo and also chose these particular um, measurements from echo. Um, so basically the, the correlation plot is kind of a busy slide in that, um, but it basically shows that we, in this panel, we see that uh, when the heart is more dilated, it's more weak. And that's what we see in human uh, humans with heart failure. And uh, we also noticed that when the heart wall continues to be thick towards the end, there's more compensation and those hearts don't tend to dilate as much. And so um, it just tells us that we have a spectrum of um, heart phenotypes that are similar to humans and also in terms of prognostic value, it's similar to what we would observe in, in human population. Um, to understand the phenotypes a little better, be better because we are working with uh, time series data and also um, data that are are somewhat correlated to each other all around. So we try to figure out um, what are the relationships between time points uh, in between traits. And so these are principal component analysis of isopaternal induced changes. So these are changes above baseline. And um, based on the variable factor map on the left, uh, we see that fractional shortening uh, at week two and week three, as well as internal dimension at week two and three are are basically on the same same axis almost um, that um, it indicates that those traits tend to go together. So the more 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 dilation, the the lower the fractional shortening would be. And then on the other axis, we see that there's a different trait um, that is sort of orthogonal to the the first principal component, and that is uh, left ventricular mass. Um, for some reason, that one is a diff slightly different because that measure is affected by also how much the wall thickens. And then if you look down on the bottom left panel, the third principal component uh, points to the uh, wall thickness, IVSD, at week one. So there's something else that is controlling the, um, the, the amount of hypertrophy by week one. So that's like the initial compensation versus the eventual heart weight change. Um, and then, um, so using the principal component uh, analysis results, we were able to plot our mice according to these characteristics. And so you can see that on the panel B, top panel, the mouse KK, HIJ, again, that's the mouse that's very fibrotic uh, with ISO treatment, is sort of on the extreme right-hand side um, on, the, on the first principal component. And there's not a whole lot of left ventricular mass um, increase. Um, but there's a whole lot of dilation increase in uh, heart function. Um, and then so this is just a, a demonstration that's based on these um, uh, the principal component analysis. We can sort of overlay this with classical picture that we all learn. Um, when we first started learning cardiology, there is um, concentric hypertrophy where the wall thickness increases and then there's eccentric hypertrophy where the heart dilates and it's kind of weak um, and so so it's a similar idea. So um, because we have these inbred mouse strains we can also calculate something called heritability. Heritability is basically 
um, uh, a calculation of the proportion of observed differences due to genetic variation. So in inbred model organisms such as this one, where the environment is controlled and multiple animals have identical genetic background is available, between strain and uh, with between strain and within strain can be variation can be used to estimate something called broad sense heritability that reflects all genetic contribution to phenoty to phenotypic variants. Um, and so the majority of the traits that we examined were highly, highly heritable, and our broad sense has uh, broad sense heritability estimates in the panel were uh, were much higher than uh, the estimates in human population. Um, uh, in human, the the maximum that we've seen is probably 60 percent for left ventricular mass in a twin study. Um, and uh, and then there's something called a narrow sense heritability, which is the proportion of phenotypic variance due to additive genetic effects alone. And that's the upper bound of what can be mapped in a genome-wide association study. And we also calculated uh, narrow sense heritability. Um, and for the left ventricular mass, it's between 39 to 57 percent, which is all still very, very high. Um, so. So we map uh, those low side, and the number of low side that we have, it really depends on the significance threshold that we use. And so, um, so in this case, I chose to have a cutoff of uh, 4.1 times 10 to negative 6 for this slide. Um, that's after taking, um, basically having a simulated um, uh, p-value threshold um, based on permutation, and then taking uh, like a tenfold, the Bonferroni correction sort of um, based on the number of phenotypes that are associated with each other and corrected by tenfold. Um, so it's stringent by tenfold. Um, and so we have definitely have more low side than human study. And so this is just an example slide that we often tell people is that there's a, um, you know, basically there's a signal for um, right ventricular hypertrophy based on the heart weight, weight data as sacrifice. And it basically points to this um, uh, locus in on chromosome three. And uh, as we look into the locus, the, each individual SNP is um, plotted by colored dots. And the red represents that those SNPs are in strong linkage disequilibrium or strong association with the P SNP, which is in purple. And it shows this very narrow region that covers basically one gene. It's called PPP3CA. Uh, so PPP3CA is a gene that's um, uh, it's part of calcineurin. So we all know calcineurin is very important for cardiac hypertrophy and uh, just a very, very clear signal here. And so it is a sort of an example for us. Um, it's good for us to find these genes are known to be associated with um, uh, previously associated with cardiac hypertrophy. And so um, and so these are our top three signals for um, echo traits. Uh, there are additional ones that are also significant by the normal definition, but for, for stringency uh, purposes, uh, I made a cutoff uh, a little bit higher than otherwise. But um, the, the trait called week three left ventricular mass, um, this is basically an association of all the left ventricular mass um, on all the mice. Um, and then it gave us basically two significant signal on chromosome four and chromosome seven. And so chromosome four, chromosome seven was the peak um, associated signal uh, we saw earlier in the previous slide. And then chromosome four is actually overlying this area that has only four genes. And, um, and uh, in recently, uh, and also among these four genes, I, I mentioned earlier that we had expression data. We can also do genome-wide association with expression data. And uh, we found that the expression of, uh, out of all four genes, only uh, the gene KLF4 had what we call a cis That means that there's association signal between the gene expression of this gene to its genome and location. And also there is um, association of left ventricular mass to the same location. Um, in addition, there is um, negative correlation between KLF4 and LV mass. So because of this triangular uh, relationship, we can infer that the genome, whatever genetic signal that is underlying this, is lo this locus, is controlling the expression level of KLF4, which is then controlling the, um, the left ventricular mass hypertrophy trait. And so and recently, just uh, last year, 
um, there, there's been accumulated data that suggests that KL4 is important in cardiac hypertrophy. Um, but in uh, last year, somebody actually did an experiment in, um, in a KL4 knockout mice and, and treated them with isopaternal, a very similar to our study that showed that when subjected to KL, uh, isopaternal cardiac specific knockout KL4 mice demonstrated enhanced cardiac hypertrophy and also cellular enlargement and um, exaggerated expression of transcriptional regulator myocardin and fetal cardiac genes. So um, it, this result is definitely very encouraging. So the last um, slides I'm going to show is about the about validation experiments for ML, MYH14, which is which underlies the chromosome seven signal. So this is just um, additional slides showing that um, even though we the significant signal came from week three traits, but if I look at earlier time points, um, there is actually a suggestive association underlying those time points as well. And so, so from, from week to week, the echo data is definitely very consistent. Um, and this is just showing the association between KLF4 and that. Um, MIH14, this is the top association signal. And within this signal, there's only two, basically two genes. And um, uh, Izumo2 is a sperm gene. So we didn't think that that would be important. So at MIH14 became our top candidate for this gene, which is the most. Uh, so we um, we uh, did uh, siRNA knockdown of MIH. Sorry, MIH14 is a gene that is uh, part of the non-muscle mycin 2C uh, protein complex, and um, it participates in like cell division and things like that. And also in a paper. Not a few years back, it showed that it's expressed in the intercalated disc of the heart, um, and also in uh, knockout mice, it seems to mess up the cy cytokinesis of how how the nucleus divides uh, during cell division, and among other things. And so, um, uh, so we did a siRNA knockdown of this gene in uh, cell culture in neonatal raventricular mycete on the left. It shows that for some reason uh, the gene knockdown is causing the heart not to to, to, to be different. I guess um, normally with, once you treat with the cells with isoternal or phenylephrine, the cells hypertrophy, that's a normal response. And after the siRNA knockdown of MIH14, the cells are not as hypertrophy, or, and then also there's more rounded cells, and perhaps they're not attaching as well to the plates. Um, ultimately, we obtained knockout mice for these. And uh, we found that, indeed, the knockout mice had more ventricular dilation and uh, more uh, ventricular hypertrophy um, compared to the well type or the heterozygous um, uh, mice. And so that, and in, in a way, validated this locus as well um, and, and uh, validated that this is a candidate gene for a sort of common variation in the mouse population. Um, and there's some additional data to show that, that the intercalated disc may be wider in the knockout mice, and there's a bit more fibrosis. And then, um, and also the uh, marker in P is more high, uh, high, highly expressed in the knockout mice once treated with isopaternal. And then because we have uh, this huge uh, data, it's not huge on the big data sense. I guess it's median on the big data sense. We have this mouse database. We have expression data on the heart tissue. We have phenotype data. We also have additional expression data and phenotype data on other studies that have done on the same that have been done on the same panel in obesity, bone, uh, hearing, bone marrow density, hearing, etc. We're able to overlay this these data, and so um, by just finding correlation uh, between MIH14 and other genes, and also um, to see if other genes um, map to the same location as MIH14, or vice versa, with MIH14 map to other genome location, uh, in terms of MIH14 expression, um, we can find preliminary relationships that then we can test in uh, the, the experiment test experimentally. So there was um, an association between uh, FOXO1 uh, and um, MH14. And um, and so we went ahead and tested that. And it turned out, this is very pre preliminary data. Um, it turned out that FOXO1 um, expression somehow increased um, compared to wild type um, in the uh, in, in, in 
the in the mice. So for some some reason, um, missing MOH14 caused your fossil one expression to go up. Um, so that's just um, some prelim data um, for future directions. And so there, um, I guess from my standpoint, I coming from more of a uh, clinical um, experimental. Not so much tool development side, uh, but I do look forward to um, collaboration or in uh, working with uh, people that know how to develop a tool <laughs> so I can use them. Um, and, uh, and then I forgot to mention, so with each gen genomic location, um, there's a lot of gene underneath. And so we've been using BioGPS for sure uh, to look through all these um, all these genes, because it's very, very difficult. Like I said, the examples that I show had only a few genes, but there are these little side that had a large number of genes that are very difficult to tease out. So, uh, so this concludes my talk. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, all the people that worked together with me on this project in the Lucis lab and Evie Wayne lab and, um, and all the funders. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Are there any quick questions for Jessica? Um, I have, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I have a quick question for Jessica. This is David. Thank you for a great talk, Jessica. I have just a question. I noticed that all your data in the mice are more measuring uh, cardiac function, cardiac structure. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say something about the mortality rate? Because I remember seeing some strains that showed actually very high mortality rate, but very low, moderate uh, hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I find it very strange. I, yeah, uh, so I think the mortality rate um, on, from this study is a little bit hard to tease out because uh, these mortality happen very, very early on, in the first two or three days. So it's not from the typical the typical um, heart failure, uh, for, it didn't happen after heart failure developed. It was too early. Okay. Yeah, so it could have been like a drug interaction or maybe even arrhythmia from the various drugs that we gave um, for the pump implantation. The isopaternal had to be administered to an intra-abdominally implanted pump. And so that required anesthesia. I think ketamine was given. Yep. And then on the same day, usually isopaternal was uh, iso so isopaternal uh, ketamine and also isoflurane for echo uh, for sedation and so so we're not sure whether that had anything to do with it but they were all almost all early deaths. So it's more a response to the drug itself, actually. Maybe. Yeah, you know, not not the end stage heart failure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, this is Andrew. Um, great talk. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, the EQTL data. Uh, can you clarify, was that EQTL data on uh, untreated hearts or the isopaternal treated hearts? Um, so we have both. So we have both? Yeah, we have control mice and we collected um, tissues from them and prep for RNA. Yeah, so, so we have both. So there's some okay, cells that are, um, so there's some cis EQTL that are there only with ISO and some only with um, con uh, under control condition and there's some both that invariant with treatment. Got it. So the, the cis EQTLs you were mentioning, um, that's based off of which, I mean, which one ended up being more important, I guess? Um, or did you combine them in some sort of integrated analysis? Yeah, so we, we, we haven't, we haven't. So so the cis EQTL, um, so, so the example I gave earlier, I, I, it was KLF4. So for KLF4, I believe it's there both on at control and also ISO. So it, it's the control there is pretty strong. So it, it's not changed by the environment per se. So that, Got it. yeah, yeah. But and, uh, and then what would be a question? I mean, have you considered doing uh, protein PTLs? Um, no, so we don't have protein data on these. But I, I think- Andrew, that's all my fault. Um, I, we just have not had uh, opportunities to get these data together. I think uh, definitely it, it moves quickly up to the priority list. Some juncture, I think, will we'll have the data. Uh, this was meant to be part of collaboration with uh, Jake and Jessica. Cool. I mean, I think that would just be another really nice, you know, one common population with genetic 
and uh, expression and proteomic data, especially in you know uh, you know obviously when you can do um, controlled drug treatments. Uh, so anyway, that would be another really nice integrated data set. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think we're also somewhat limited by the amount of tissue we have as well. And so in order to get in a, uh, more tissue, I, we have to do the experiment over. <laughs> so that might be a a lot, um, but but I think I'm very open to discussing about like potentially human applications as well. I think that that would be a very direct way, so that we kind of a, a demonstration in mouse population. But if we can do something in human, that would be even better. Although the heterogeneity is a concern in humans, that that is a big concern. Um, the, uh, and also, I uh, Christoph Rao, who is a uh, much a much better computer scientist than me. I'm, I'm sort of like a <laughs> pretend to be one. Um, so he's done extensive analysis on CCQTLs, and also um, the, the lab is very interested in network analysis. And so there are um, a lot of people here working on just looking at gene expression data. But I, I agree with you. Without the protein data, maybe it's it's it, it can only stay at that level, just gene expression. That was very good. That was oh, very thank good. You. Yeah, I was on the, on the cell phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions for Jessica? Okay. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for the presentation and an interesting great discussion. Um, before we conclude this conference, uh, I'd like to give a quick update on regarding the conferences. Uh, so we'll be taking a break from the conference starting August 21st. Uh, which is two weeks from now. Uh, it's also the NIH site visit. Uh, the break will extend for about four weeks. Um, so we'll continue our conferences on September 18th. Um, I will reschedule those uh, who had scheduled presentations during that period. Um, and I'll also send out a reminder uh, about the break in our next weekly uh, update email. Um, are there any questions? Regarding the break. Okay, uh, if not, uh, feel free to email me uh, if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, that concludes our conference. Uh, thank you everyone for attending our today's conference. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. Thank you.